Now, let's go through an example of calculating uh, attribution analysis for a uh, multi-asset class portfolio. And so we'll begin by calculating the allocation effect, and then look at the selection effects. So for the allocation effect, remember, we're looking at differences in weights relative to our portfolio versus the benchmark and uh, holding the returns uh, for the benchmark constant across both. So what are our weights? Well, our portfolio had a 70% allocation to the equity side, uh, uh, asset class, 7% to the fixed income asset class, and 23% to cash over the evaluation period. And our benchmark was 60% equity, 30% fixed income, 10% uh, cash. So you can see that we've actually made some pretty big active um, allocation decisions. We've dramatically underweighted fixed income, um, and we've overweighted equities and cash. So let's see if that actually paid off. Now remember, the definition of the allocation effect is going to be for each asset class we're going to look at the difference between the weights in our portfolio for that asset class minus the weights in the benchmark times the return on the benchmark for that asset class. So we can get those pretty easily. Here are our returns for the benchmark of each asset class. We're looking at the S&P 500 as the equity benchmark, a fixed income index for the fixed income benchmark, and a money market interest rate as the cash benchmark. And remember, those are going to be held constant. Uh, we're just going to be looking at differences in weights. Uh, so what are the differences in weights? Well, here are our weights, 77.3%. Here are the benchmark weights, uh, 60, 30, 10. Here are the active deviations from benchmark. We see that we made a big under allocation to fixed income. So now let's see how well that paid off. What we're going to do is we're going to take these differences in weights, multiply them by the benchmark index returns, and add them up. So if we do that, if we say 10% over allocation to equity times the return on equity plus negative 23% uh, under allocation to debt uh, times the return on debt or fixed income. That equals this much. And 13% uh, over allocation to cash times the return on cash. All taken together, we see that this adds up to about 3.1%. So first of all, what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that this is a positive allocation effect, right? Um, and second of all, uh, how much? Well, it looks like we improved performance by 0.31% uh, uh, due to making better um, allocation decisions between these three centers. And remember, the reason that is so, the reason that we had all these up is because what we're supposed to be doing is we're supposed to be summing up across our allocation effects for each uh, asset class from uh, one to three, because we've only got three asset classes in this simple example. Now what about security selection? Well, here our, exam our uh, task is particularly simple because there really isn't such a thing as security selection in cash, so all we really have to look at is how did our equity portfolio perform in terms of returns relative to the benchmark? And how did our fixed income portfolio perform relative to uh, the returns on the benchmark? Cash is cash, so we're not going to claim that we found a better uh, money market fund. But it looks like we actually beat the benchmark in returns in both cases. So if we write out the selection equation, Remember, for each asset class, 
what we're going to do is we're going to multiply the portfolio weights, so WPI, times the difference between the return on that asset class of securities in our portfolio minus the return on those asset class securities in the benchmark. And we're again going to add this up across all of the three asset classes that we're dealing with in this example. So remember the cash one is essentially a wash because we assume that the return on cash uh, is going to be the same in both cases. So really it's just the two sectors that we have to sort out, uh, two asset classes I should say. So for equities, we outperform the benchmark by 1.47%, 7.28 minus 5.81 uh, the return on the benchmark, and we had 70% of our portfolio. For fixed income, we earned 1.89 on our fixed income assets, the benchmark earned 1.45, the excess performance therefore is also positive 0.44, so we actually made better picks both in fixed income and in equities. Uh, not always going to be the case, but that's a great result. And we multiply by our portfolio weight for that, add those up, and we see that our contribution uh, for uh, selection was 1.06%. And then finally, uh, remember these should add up to our total if we recall the uh, sort of mathematical result, that if we add up allocation plus selection, we should get the total return on our portfolio uh, relative to that of the benchmark. Weights on the portfolio times the returns of the portfolio minus the weights on the benchmark times the returns on the benchmark uh, for all uh, securities uh, or asset classes on. Uh, now was that true? Well, we can actually go through this. We can calculate what our weights were and what our returns were. And we can see that the return to our managed portfolio was 5.47. The return to our benchmark portfolio was 3.97. And the, therefore, outperformance in total was 1.37. But now we know how much of that came from where. Remember the allocation effect was 0.31%. Let's write that as 0.31 just to make it clear. And the selection effect was 1.06%. And if you add those up, 1.06 plus 0.31, you get exactly 1.37. So now we know how this total excess performance uh, was actually divvied up. It seems like the bulk of it was driven by the selection effect, the 1.06% excess return, and about a third of that was driven by allocation. So we happen to have a good manager who's actually able to do both tasks uh, in a superior fashion, it seems, but this one would have a particular advantage, it seems, in security selection. Uh, but this is how we could divide whatever the observed excess returns were, positive or negative, um, into how much of that relative performance was due to uh, asset allocation or selection. Now, as an aside, the CFA material treats attribution analysis a bit differently. Um, what they do is actually separate what they call an interaction effect uh, from selection, um, and that one is sort of like the joint effect of allocation and selection. Um, do you make, uh, do you allocate more capital uh, to sectors or to asset classes where you are more likely to make better picks, or do you allocate less capital uh, to sectors where you're more likely to make worse picks? Those would be positive interaction effects. And on the other hand, if you over allocate uh, to sectors where you make worse picks and under allocate to ones where you make better picks, that would be a negative interaction. 
So the math still works out exactly the same way. In fact, if you look at the definition of the allocation effect, uh, this is the same. Uh, whether you do it the Bodhi King and Marcus way or the CFA way, uh, allocation is allocation. Um, the way that the CFA Institute makes selection and interaction separate, because uh, remember in the graphical illustration, uh, essentially Bodhi King and Marcus just combine uh, this uh, other effect as part of, part of selection. The way that you can parse them out is instead of looking at portfolio weights by looking at differences in uh, portfolio returns from benchmark returns, if you want to separate them out, just use the benchmark weights, not portfolio weights. That's the key difference. And then if you define the interaction effect just the way that we described, uh, where you essentially have differences both in weights and in returns, such that an interaction effect is positive if you over allocate to asset classes or sectors where you outperform, and you under allocate to those uh, sectors or asset classes where you underperform, those are positive additions to interaction and negative additions would be over allocating to sectors where you underperform and under allocating to sectors where you overperform. Um, if you now add all of these three up, you'll still end up with that same mathematical relation that they still just break up the uh, weighted return on your portfolio relative to the benchmark, total excess return. Uh, just this way you get it broken out into three separate components. Um, so some, uh, Practitioners will not like the interaction effect because it's perhaps more difficult to interpret, but if you view it as this idea of simply do you allocate more uh, to asset classes or sectors where you make better picks and less uh, to ones where you make worse picks, uh, that seems intuitive enough. So you can do it this way as well. The key, remember, is just to do it this way, you substitute in benchmark weights instead of portfolio weights when you define the selection. And if you do, you can create sort of a similar graphical view uh, to what we had prior, except that now it actually does separate it out into three separate issues. So our large rectangle here is our total portfolio return, our total return on the portfolio times the total uh, weights in the portfolio, and that is broken up into the part that is attributable to the benchmark and then the amount that is added by allocation. Remember, uh, we use the benchmark returns and look at differences in active weights, whether you over or under allocate in your portfolio relative to the benchmark. This time for the selection effect, we're going to use the benchmark weights and still look at excess returns uh, within each asset class or sector. And then finally, this last interaction term, this is going to be the um, joint effect of allocation to sectors where you have superior or inferior performance relative to the benchmark. So this is sort of how you can break your performance up into all three, if you choose. Thank you for listening.